Jonah, a huge welcome to the Lead on Purpose podcast. Thanks for having me, mate. Mate, it was such a, an honor to, to stand alongside you and connect with you uh, at a conference in Brisbane uh, last year. And when I heard you speak, I really resonated with not only what you spoke about, but how you actually packaged it. It was so uh, palatable, so straightforward. You distilled all of these complex ideas around pressure, around performing with pressure, and you distilled it in a way that I, th I think that we can all really get. So thanks for taking the time to go a bit deeper with us today. Yeah, looking forward to the conversation, mate. Uh, it's going to be fun. Well, let's start with this. What is pressure? Ah, it's a big question to start with, right? Um, <laughs> well, the, it, I always think about it. There's some degree of truth of the context, right? If, the, if you're standing inside a stadium with 100,000 people playing the Super Bowl this morning, you know, that's, that's a reality and that, that involves some degree of extrinsic pressure, social evaluation, judgment, an outcome people are chasing, et cetera. And then, of course, you've got the intrinsic component of that, which is why, you know, of the, what is that, 80-odd people playing, <laughs> something huge teams in NFL, for example, you know, each individual will have their own story around pressure based upon, you know, all those human things like dreams, hopes, aspirations, past experiences, personality values, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, a, it's, a, it's the... It's the it's the collision between an extrinsic environmentally imposed constraint and then the interpretation of that from a whole myriad of intrinsic drivers. I hope that's not too much of a mouthful. No, it's great. And so the thing is, and what I'm hearing, and I'm sure the listener gets it as well, is we all experience pressure, yet some people seem to embrace it. Other people seem to maybe wrestle with it. Others try to diminish it or just totally make it go away. So. In your experience, what is the best thing to do with pressure when you're a performer, whether you're performing on stage, you're public speaking, you're you know taking that final shot on the 18th green, what should we be doing with pressure? Yeah, sure. Well, firstly, let's just take a step back and, and realize that every single person will interpret the same situation differently. And it, I sort of touched upon that based upon past experience, perceptions of competence, what's at stake for them, um, or what have you. So that, that means that, you know, our relationship to that very moment can be really shaped by a lot of factors. When, you know, the question being, well, what's the overlapping solution there, Jonah? What do the people who seem to, you know, navigate pressure well, you know, what do they have in common? And you've probably heard the cliche, pressure is a privilege. Mm -hmm. but it's pretty useful to sort of stop and remind ourselves of that. Like in, in the sporting context, right? Like if you're in, if you're, I don't know, if you're in a war zone and pressure goes up, it probably means something bad's going on, right? So I'm very careful in using that cliche haphazardly, but in the world that I mainly work, the more pressure that comes normally means you've done something right. Generally, I mean, okay, you know, we're, we're, we're losing, uh, my contract's on the line. Like, I get there's other scenarios where pressure can come. But by and large, you play, you know, you're playing the season, you make the preliminary finals. Oh, a bit more pressure. Oh, we've made the grand final. Oh, more pressure. You know, my clients make the Olympics. Oh, more pressure. It's like you've got to remind themselves that often it's, it's the byproduct of doing something really well. And, you know, I use a lot of playful analogy, as you know, and, you know, if I'm climbing Mount Everest and all of a sudden I'm getting to that really top section of the, they call it the death zone where the air gets thin. If I turned to a colleague and went, oh, Struth, the air's getting thin. Like I imagine I'd get looked at it with a bit of an incredulous look. Like, are you kidding me, mate? Like, you know, no shit, right? <laughs> like that's the price of entry for getting to the death zone. Like this is what's, this is what comes with getting to the very top of the mountain. Well, I like to relate to pressure a bit the same. Like you want to go to the NFL grand, you know, the, the, the Super Bowl, you want to, you know, race in Formula One, you want to go to the gold medal sort of match in, at the Olympics. Well, you know, pressure might be, you know, a familiar friend that may show up, which then brings me to what do we do? And 
It's really about not engaging in control strategies to attempt to suppress, distract, run away from, replace, avoid the very, um, I call it a bit of the story or the noise that shows up in our brain, right? Like our brains have evolved to respond to anxiety. You know, we see a snake, we want to move away from it. We've got deep neural architecture that says, when you think and feel this way, listen to me and do something to avoid. Yet here I am choicefully running onto the onto the football field. Here I am, you know, entering the, the octagon of the UFC match. So, you know, we're often asking ourselves to do things that naturally are somewhat in tension with some of our neural sort of substrates in the brain. So that's why we have to be a bit intentional with it. And, you know, what's the best way I can sort of summarize it? It's, it's the more we can learn to accept pressure and anxiety is merely the price of entry to normalize it and if i can be okay at just sitting with it and letting it be there it frees me up to focus on the task at hand mm -hmm. now the number one reason athletes and coaches you know or surgeons or ceos or actors or it doesn't matter who i'm working with the number one reason they underperform when pressure's around isn't because of the pressure it's because they're trying to control their interpretation of it. They're trying, they're trying to minimize that experience. They're trying to get rid of the butterflies. They're trying to get rid of some of the worrisome thoughts or the, 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 the muscle tension or the whatever's showing up for them. They, they see it as a bad thing and they're making a correlational error that when I feel this way or think this way, I'm going to perform poorly. Whereas the truth is when I try to wrestle with my pressure and anxiety, it hijacks me, it sucks me in, it then takes my focus away from what I'm trying to do and therefore my breakdown in performance is a breakdown in focus. Mm -hmm. It's not because of my heart rate, it's not because of my butterflies, it's not because of some thoughts in my brain, it's because I'm focusing typically on those things and trying to do something with them rather than going, yep, okay, I'm nervous. Something of importance is at play here and that's okay. Now, what am I here to do? I'm here to behave. You know, the ball doesn't give a shit what I'm thinking. So what do I need to do here right now and bring yourself back to those behavioral anchors? 100%. And that's really, really powerful. I mean, it takes me back, Jonah, probably 13 years of age and I was preparing for the World Solo Drumming Championship, uh, similar to maybe um, figure skating where you're out there by yourself and there's a panel of adjudicators and it's very subjective. And leading up to that, I was in my head thinking, what do they want to hear? How do they want it to be delivered? Then on the day, as I get to go on, I'm like, actually, I'm not in control of any of those things. That's scary. I can't control what they want to hear. I don't know what it is they're looking for. The butterflies came on, the hands started sweating. And it was interesting, you know, at 13, trying to figure out what to do. Do I try and diminish? Do I try and engage? Do I try and just play through and that set me in motion after that but from a pretty young age of going how does this brain of ours work what impact do my thoughts have what what's going to serve me and I was reading some of the older literature back then like the inner game uh, of golf inner game of music but I know things have changed and evolved so much there's still a lot of relevant stuff in there but things have changed a lot so for you you know going back to those old the old literature and old way of psychology and dealing with pressure. What do you think has changed? What What's the narrative change that we need to be embracing? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I say it's not about reducing stress and pressure. It's about building capacity to embrace more. That's the biggest pivot. Even when I went through university, I was trained explicitly in techniques of how to help clients reduce their anxious experience. Thought stopping, deep breathing, cue words, positive self-talk, relaxation, you know, all these techniques that were basically saying anxiety is bad. You as a psychologist need to help your clients be less anxious and therefore that will lead to them performing well. Absolute lie, absolutely scientifically incorrect. And if you know anything about brain function, it's an impossibility. We worry about things we care about. You know, it'd be like me having a gun at somebody's head and saying, control your heart rate or I'm going to shoot you. Like, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> good luck, right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, step one, it's not reducing stress and pressure. It's building people's capacity for embracing even more, you know. And, you know, strength and conditioning, physiotherapy, you know, medicine get this, and I've got that a lot 
longer than maybe psychology has taken a while to catch up. You know, you get a muscle tear now, maybe back in the 1970s, they put an ice pack on it and say, you know, rest for a week and get back out there. But now, if you get a muscle tear in your calf or something, you know, once it's actually, you know, initially healed, you're doing a whole bunch of strength training because the physios and docs said, you got a muscle tear because you weren't strong enough in that muscle for the load of what your sport demands. You need to pack into a scrum. You need to jump high, run fast, whatever it is. Your muscles need to be able to tolerate the load of what your sport demands. So we're going to make you stronger so you don't get another muscle tear. Well, psychology has got to be the same. What's the demand that your sport or your career is placing upon you? Oh, well, I need to perform in front of, you know, a hypercritical environment with, with you know, contracts on the line and lots of money at stake or, you know, whatever it is. And therefore, there's going to be a fair bit of pressure showing up both internally and externally. Oh, okay. Therefore, psychologically, we need to actually strengthen you and build your capacity. So that's the biggest pivot is that the psychological science has now caught up to that. And, you know, I spend my life, you know, helping clients exactly build capacity for whatever their life is throwing at them. Probably the second one is it's not about positive thinking. It's about taking positive action, no matter what you feel. Uh, and somewhere along the line, I think that got a bit mixed up, like the, the, the power of positive thinking. Look at all these um, amazing high-performing people. They have nothing but unwavering self-belief. Oh, an abject lie. You know, I, like you, I work with those people. Yeah. They're human. They, they have fears, doubts, worries. They feel fraudulent. They feel all those normal things, but they're very good at behaving consistently in the right way in the presence of whatever shows up. So, you know, we don't need to always wake up and have positivity for breakfast. Matter of fact, some of the most high achieving people in the world are just as fearful, worried and doubtful as anybody else. They just seem a bit better at not letting that dictate the actions they take. So really understanding what's the behavioral requirement of, of your job. Um, and probably the third one would be, it's not about motivating people. It's about connecting people to what matters. You know, there's a, there's a whole bunch of work around human motivation and it's quite interesting. Um, in terms of lasting behaviour change, you know, if you can get somebody to connect to something far deeper than just maybe some, you know, surface level motivation or even intrinsic motivation, it's actually where does that intrinsic motivation come from? And you connect to that deeper driver of that internal you know, intrinsic motivation, you, you get lasting change, right? Um, you know, I might lose weight because I've got an upcoming wedding. I want to look good in my suit. But as soon as I'm married, you know, six months later, I'm back to the weight I was, <laughs> you know, and you see that all the time. If I want to nurture my health and fitness so I can be a healthy dad, and stay alive and role model to my kids that being healthy is a really important thing to value in your life. That's probably going to keep me a bit more on the road of health and fitness far beyond. I looked good in my suit on my wedding day. So, you know, it's really important if you want to look at lasting behavior change to connect to not just simple motivational levers, but connecting to things that deeply matter to people. Mm -hmm. And that's really interesting. You know, when you look at sport, it's like helping the athlete, the individual to really go deep with what it means to be the best in field at that sport. And I want to just unpack a few things that was just incredible. So building capacity, I think that's just a big mindset shift for a lot of people, because I know for decades, people have been told, you know, you've got to just learn how to diminish, to breathe through it, to reduce, you know, all these feelings that you're getting physiologically. So where, where do we build capacity? So if I was um, an individual, there's a lot of pressure being put on me by myself and maybe external forces. Where, where do I start building capacity so I can start to really embrace that and operate well with it? Yeah, great question. <laughs> I'm a bit playful. Um <laughs> I've never seen an athlete grow muscles sitting in a room talking to their strength and conditioning coach. You want to get strong, you've got to throw some tin around in the gym, right? Yeah. Well, if you want to build your psychological capacity, you've got to go expose yourself to some things that stretch you, not just sit in a room with a psychologist talking about it. 
You know, people often ask, why do I travel the world so much with my clients? It's because I'm there to do exposure work. You know, if somebody had a fear of heights and I'm a psychologist, part of my behavioral exposure is taking them on a, on a, you know, a trip to something of heights and setting up some, de you know, systematic desensitization to that, you know, noxious stimuli. Well, that's no different in the performance space, right? You need to seek out things that generate discomfort. And it's only through that exposure that you update the mental model of your capacity to function in that space and get better at sitting with the inherent discomfort that will show up. So, I mean, you know, stoicism certainly knew that 3,000 years ago, right? <laughs> For those yeah. who are listening, you know, you can go down a deep rabbit hole of reading up about, you know, the, 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 the stoics and all that stuff. But, you know, anti-fragility, you know, that showed up and all really good things because it says that the only way to strengthen is through exposure. Again, how do you build muscles? You lift some weights that are heavy enough to actually introduce some muscle tear. You know, everyone listening here would have the basic understanding of physiology of getting stronger in the gym. You actually have to cause trauma, damage. You tear those muscle fibers and then, the, the, you know, the tears fill in and you get muscle growth. So you go with light, light weights, you won't get, you know, stronger. You've got to expose you to a sufficient stimuli that actually causes a bit of almost damage, right? Well, I'm not promoting seeking psychological damage per se, but <laughs> bloody hell, go out and push yourself. Oh, I don't like uh, eating uh, tomatoes. I'll just push them off the side of my plate. I don't like speaking in public. I don't like doing an ice bath. I don't like talking up in a team meeting or I don't like passing the ball, you know, to a, to a teammate when we've broken the line and whatever. Like it, you'll see that experiential avoidance is the term. You'll see that showing up everywhere, right? You know, how do you go telling someone when they're spinach in their teeth? Oh, I, my eyes dance around and I look for the stage exit left, right? We've got to get better when some discomfort shows up to just learn to sit with that. That's a moment of growth. That's an opportunity of growth right there. And that's how we build capacity. So exposure to the environments that probably make you feel some discomfort, but with a mindset of curiosity and willingness to, you know, play in that space in the pursuit of something bigger like i want to excel in my career i want to have greater mental health i want to be a better leader i want to whatever that is it's you've got to connect to your why otherwise you won't do it right you'll just interpret it as pain and avoid it because humans are crap at pointless pain yeah yeah but if we, connect to something, if we connect to something of value we'll endure great hardship and this whole idea of you've mentioned it a couple of times discomfort at no point did you say pain so how do we keep pushing ourselves into that discomfort zone without it going to pain and us just quitting? Because a lot of people, when they experience pain, are like, screw that. That was awful. I vomited never again. But how can we dance in that area of discomfort? Mm. <laughs> awesome question. The very interpretation of pain, right? is completely contextually bound. So let's talk about physical pain, not just psychological pain. How many of your listeners have probably played a game of footy, you know, rugby or something, and at the end of it, when they've gone into the sheds, they've looked down and noticed, oh, they're bleeding from the knee or shin or somewhere, and they didn't even know, right? Um, they didn't actually even register feeling that. Yet later that night, when they get up for a piss and they stub their toe, they normally call for emergency services. Man down, ah, I'm an <laughs> right? <laughs> so our brain actually filters and changes the very interpretation of pain based upon whether it's important right now or not. Like we know this literally from a physiological standpoint. It wasn't that you were just distracted because you're playing a game of rugby and the crowd was noisy. Your brain literally said, Right now, it's not that useful to feel that slight cut on your shin. So I won't even send really a, a pain signal to your brain. But in the middle of the night in the dark, I want you to be hypersensitive to any pain because I don't want you to fall over and kill yourself or something. So your brain is always changing your relationship to pain. It is no different psychologically. No different. 
me having to stand up in front of a, a, a meeting and give a colleague some feedback on something, you know, I might find that really hard if I haven't connected to something more important like we've got to achieve something in this company and it's too important for us to get our own fears, doubts, worries in the way of just speaking the truth in the pursuit of what we're trying to, you know, develop or build. Or I want to be the best version of myself as a leader and I really want to come to work and feel like I can be that. Therefore, right now, my short-term discomfort is less important than me you know, providing that feedback, you know? At, I think I used this, maybe this metaphor in that talk you and I did together where, you know, if if a ball rolls on the road and I'm playing basketball with my kids, you know, and a car's coming along, I let the car hit the ball. But if my daughter runs out onto the road to grab that ball, you know, I'm out there. I actually don't care how painful the car is. I don't care how much pain it's going to bring me. I'm just focusing on how important my daughter is and therefore I'm willing to experience death, <laughs> you know? So what does that show? It's not how painful something is, it's how important something is. Okay, I'm getting fired up. I'm getting excited right now with what you just said. So the whatever field I'm in, so for the listener that's listening right now, they're all in specific fields. Some of them are on field, off field, they're in corporate, yeah. they're in sport. Yeah. If I want to be BIF, so best in field, world class, world's best ever, how do I turn up the importance meter to the point where almost I would go as far to the point where I'd be willing to die for this, to push myself physically, mentally, uh, to put the time in? How can we dial up the importance meter and really make that our central focus to achieve at world class? Yeah, cool. It's it's about realizing that whatever we do in life is merely a vehicle for the expression of our values. And so I'll have to get a bit Dr. Phil here for a moment, right? Love it. It's, it's people will think they, I don't know, oh, I just love rugby or I love Formula One or I love being a CEO or I love being a surgeon. And it's like, yeah, but if you actually weren't physically built as you are, you wouldn't be a professional athlete. You would have had to find a different profession. But you've got the same brain. You've got the same personality. You've got the same values deep within your heart. But you just don't have the same body that would allow you to be a professional athlete. So what the heck are you going to do? And what you'd find is these people would seek out some other form of interesting high-performance pursuits. It might be a coffee shop. It's just a bloody good one. Or it could be an origami shop. Don't care what it is. People get so caught up in what we do. It's actually realizing that what we pursue in life might be because we have some, you know, physical talents or intellect for, or we've inherited the family business or whatever, right? But it's got nothing to do with the person who's actually in that career. And why do you love playing rugby, being a surgeon, being a CEO, being an engineer of a racing car team, what have you, is it? it's that allows you to bring your values to life. And when you can understand your values, everyone has values. A lot of people just haven't stopped to find out and discover. And when you do, it's life-changing, right? And the science, the psychological science, you know, supports that. Then you realise that at any moment in any given day, it's merely an opportunity for me to dial up the expression of those. And when that becomes literally your only purpose in life is just to, to pursue life in a values congruent way, you know, that important factor is, is normally dialed right up. Does that make sense? Or that too? too no, that yeah. makes absolute sense. And you know, to me, you know, once we get connected with those values, it gives us a, a certain per perspective or a filter of the world around us. So we can obviously do lots of values based uh, tests and assessments. But if someone was sitting there right now and they've pulled the car over or they've stopped running, whatever they're doing as they listen right now, and they've got a pen and paper and they want to just go a little bit deeper and go, what are some of my values? How would you say, you know, what's a good way to go about discovering your inner values? Yeah, sure. The first thing I always ask all my clients is tell me what your values are. 
because it's amazing how honestly if you're forced sometimes you might not be completely right with the language of the words but instantly some themes just jump out like oh i don't know people would probably say that i'm you know duh, 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 or these are things so that's the start point the second one is i play around with things like what do you want people to say at your funeral not oh she were founded a company that was worth this much and the share price went to here and and you know he scored this many points in the letters low and like Come on, right? The people that love you, your kids, your, your family, your best mate. You know, I always think, what do I want them to say? Because I'm not going to be there. What are they going to say about me if I've lived this life in the right way? You know? Um, so that's a really powerful, interesting question to think about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, or at your 65th birthday or some milestone or, you know, or if you were eavesdropping at a cocktail party and, you, you know, your best friend or your wife or your husband was talking about you to somebody and saying, you know, what is it about, you know, he or her and the relationship you've got? What is it about you that fell in love with him or her? And you get to hear that, you know, mm -hmm. voyeuristic conversation. What do you actually want them to say, you know? Um, those types of things. And then there's also just reverse engineering. What are the things you spend your time pursuing or doing? And you know, what does a holiday look like? Oh, well, you know, I normally um, like to go uh, parasailing through the Andes with my mates once we've um, skydived off the, okay, right, interesting. That's telling me something about, I don't know, adventure and curiosity and, you know, versus I like to go to the state library and catalog all the books and read and yeah, oh, okay, interesting. Maybe there's something around, you know, pursuit of learning and knowledge. And so, you know, everyone will have a, 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 yeah, our life often tells us a bit about the things we value, but also the values expression. And that's a really important distinction is people get a bit mixed up when they do values questionnaires and reflections is they, they actually end up answering the things they value versus values. You know, I value being a dad, I value my mates, I value learning and growth. I, you know, they're things that are important to me. But when I'm being the best dad or the best psychologist or the best, you know, mate, I'm really connected to mastery. So the pursuit of mastery, I've always said, why, do I, why did I learn a lot? Why did I do a lot of degrees? Why do I still read? It's, I don't want an end point. I just want a lifelong pursuit of just learning, yeah? So I use the word mastery that's just, the immaterial of the actual word you put around it, it's the meaning behind it curiosity i'm a much better dad when i'm curious otherwise i'm judgmental as to why my son just put black texture all through my nice couch or something it's like hey bud what's happening here <laughs> Leave <the> curiosity <laughs> you know um playfulness one of my core values which is why i, I try to sort of do all my work in a, a slightly you know playful way I, I enjoy that and I think I'm a better version of myself and I think my clients learn better when I'm in that space and, and value I like doing things of value and bringing value so you know my, my core values I make sure I can dial them up and explicitly define them as behaviors they're not words they're not intentions they're not lovely decals on footy club walls they're behaviors what does curiosity look like for me dot 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 in this area or domain um, and then it's just a decision making tool for me it's just okay is that a towards or an away move from me being true to that um i'll give a buyer be warned here if people listening go down that rabbit hole of really discovering their values life becomes a lot harder a lot harder but so much more rich and rewarding mm -hmm. and that that hard that you're talking about is I'm, a, I'm imagining it's it, because you're going to have to grow and you're going to be challenged and you're going to push through things that are very uncomfortable. Exactly. Being the best version of ourselves is hard. <laughs> we want to be emotionally governed. We want to kick the dog. We want to criticize the staff member. We want to, you know, eat those simple carbohydrates on the couch and not go for that <laughs> run. Right. Like <laughs> it's hard, you know, it's, it's, if I say I want to pursue to pursue a life of mastery and I think about my profession and all I want to do is sleep on that airplane ride because I can justify that I've been busy and working long hours versus actually read a couple more journal articles and maybe that book or what have you, you know, one feels harder than the other. But how do I feel when I get off that flight? So much more rich and rewarded that I'm glad I just, you know, 
did it a little bit to nurture my my learning growth and my career and there was values congruence so i'm less critical of myself just like when you get out of bed and go for that run when your brain wants to say hit the snooze button we always feel so much better when we come back from it so yeah doing values work is amazing but you've got to know what you're signing up for it not only means you you've got that a bit of accountability to doing things that you might have historically avoided mm. yeah and that to me that's where the true growth is and you talked about it being hard but i guess both options are hard to to stick to these unhealthy toxic disempowering things that's hard and it ends up pretty ugly at the end uh, but then also the growth stuff that's hard so i guess choose your hard yeah i love that absolutely absolutely yes yeah, it's often short term hard versus long term benefit you know so the short term pain the short term you know relationship to that chatter in the brain versus you know i say to all my professional athletes a lot you know do you want to feel good at the start of the game or at the end of the game because, oh, no, I've got to get myself really positive and pump up and calm down. Hang on. I only gave you an option. It can't be both. Do you want to feel good now or at the end of this game? And thankfully, most of them actually get it. And they're like, well, good at the end. Okay, cool. So how about we stop worrying about how you're thinking and feeling right now and focus on your role and your job and, and your tactics and your competence. And uh, let's get after that, hey? And then let's meet at the end of the match and see how we're feeling, you know? And, That's brilliant. Yeah, I was yeah. chatting recently with professional athlete just around um, setting goals and first place, first place, first place, you know, at worst top three, like this is what they were focused on. And I said, well, that's interesting. And I get that like the, you're there to win, but would not, you know, just why would we focus maybe more so on habits, on uh, rituals, on routines and becoming masterful and world-class at those. And therefore the outcome will probably be a reflection of how well you've done on those things because the outcome focusing on first place to me that's just so wide like what does that even mean but when you're focused on certain drills mindset routine then you can impact it so for the athlete that's sitting now going okay do i just meditate visualize on first place first place gold medal or do i park that and go yeah that's where i'd love to end up that's cool and then reverse engineer all the things I can control. Well, what's your what's your advice for that athlete? Yeah, well, you pretty well answered it in the question, right? It's I use outcome performance process. Okay. You know, you, you definitely set an outcome, right? It's 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 you're allowed to say I want to climb Mount Everest. Um, then it's like, okay, well, what are the performance sort of behaviors that are going to allow me or put me in the best position? to achieve that outcome. Mm -hmm. Okay, I need to, you know, make sure I'm spreading in defense, communicating in offense, make sure that I'm, you know, blah, 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 whatever the environment is. Everyone, everyone generally knows what they need to do. I've never met an athlete who doesn't. Um, and then I say, okay, now you've got your key strengths, behaviors that really are you being the best version of yourself that would lead to the best performance, which would then put you in the best position to get that outcome. Cool, what's maybe one, you know, or one to three process anchors or cues that might just, you know, bring you back to that when the inevitability comes of pressure, fatigue, pain, you know, context of the scoreboard, whatever's showing up. And that's why we go from, yep, I want to win this match. Great. I want to really work on my, you know, A, B and C in terms of how I attack the match and play to my strengths. Cool. Therefore, my cues are going to be A, B and C. And that's just going to be my little, slightly almost like a little, you know, behavioral anchor that just I come back to and then I, you know, that's that ascending chain now. So yes, we reverse engineer. Cool. What are we going to anchor to that then allows you to, to display that? Yeah. And for someone that's listening right now, going, what, what might that be? What might that process anchor be? What are some examples do you think that somebody could really, really get? Yeah. Okay. Um, it would have to be super specific and super nuanced to their environment. So if I'm a midfielder in Australian football and at stoppages, I get a little flat-footed and reactive because we know the anxious brain gets, you know, hypervigilant and scans and therefore we get reactive, not proactive. So the coach and I have been working on, come on, Joni, you've got to be more proactive. You've got to be more proactive. You've got to it's like I've heard that a thousand times. Okay, well, what's a cue that might make you more proactive? Uh, it's when I'm actually just moving my feet. I'm not flat-footed. It's as simple as that. I know how to play the game. I know how to tackle. I know how to part. You know, all that stuff's actually pretty second nature. I literally just get flat-footed 
at that moment in the game. So my cue is just going to be fast feet or on my toes, something so simple like that then brings out the rest of the behavior. Brilliant. So don't complicate it. It's just what's the superordinate cue? So this is a really important one. I always look for what's the superordinate. What do I mean by that? What's the highest cue that leads to the descending behavior? Like if, if that footballer had to now, uh, you know, uh, you know um, balance my weight, communicate, use my hips to create weight distribution, make sure that I'm also like, you know, there'll be a hundred things and there's no way their brain and their working memory is going to remember any of that with fatigue and pressure. So, all right, well, what's the simplest cue that if we connect to it, everything else flows from it? And that's what I look for is, is if that makes sense, the highest, simplest cue that then just lets everything come from there. And then you normally end up with that descending chain of motor, you know, motor patterns that come out. I love that, Jonah, that's just so simple. And that the person listening, if they're thinking about those anchors, it's not a complex set of rituals that take 10 minutes. It's one simple motion, one simple thing that they can relate to that sets off this trigger, that triggers off this, this thought pattern, this, this motion action taking pattern. Yeah, totally. And, you know, if there's some historical technique breakdown in a fine motor control, like a, a tennis player seems to always fault on second serve when it's, uh, you know, a, a spicy point, you know, a break point and what have you. And, okay, how does a second serve break down? Uh, their ball toss always just goes that little bit too low. So they end up hitting it into the net typically. Um, okay, great. So what's our cue going to be? You know, up to the right or up, or just something that says, if I get my ball toss in the right position, I know how to hit a bloody second serve, even if I am scared and caught up in that story a little bit. It's the behavioral breakdown of this of the serve that's actually leading, leading to the error, not the presence of the anxiety. So all I need to do is make room for the inherent nerves of, oh, shit, it's second serve break point. Okay, feeling a bit, a bit uncomfortable. What's my solution? Not get rid of my nerves or thoughts about don't double fault because you're going to have those for the rest of your life. It's and up to the right. And there's your superordinate cue that then leads to the, the correct service action. That's brilliant. And yeah, to me, again, that's very simple. It's a command. So it's a, it's a hey, this is what we're going to do. It's a, it's a direction for our focus to be placed. Uh, I really enjoy that. Now, what about individual versus group? So let's say we've got... Um, golfer uh, versus uh, a footy team when we're working with an individual versus working with a team uh, well, what are the differences in terms of the conversation you're having can you work with a whole team and add tremendous value in terms of them embracing pressure and and the whole idea of performance psychology uh, and what's it like with an individual yeah great question the work that i do in the science that i bring is trans diagnostic so that just means it literally transcends psychopathologies like depression and anxiety all the way through to leadership and decision making all the way from individual to family systems to group dynamics it doesn't matter it's trans diagnostic and it applies you just need to see the client as the team so it's okay what does this team do when it's being the best version of ourselves oh jonah we we move the ball through the midfield we we we, we attack the line we communicate well we you know, we, we value defense through these behaviors, blah, blah, blah. It's always pretty obvious. They know how to play well and they're easy and they're quite quick to de define that. And then it's simply, now let's look at that where we go when pressure inev inevitably comes. And, you know, if you know enough about human function, that one of the vulnerabilities of group dynamics is that when pressure comes, we get quite individualistic, right? It's like, we're all good. We're a happy community. And then a lion got loose from the zoo. Everyone run, you know, we, we, you know, <laughs> whereas it'd be much better if we actually bandied together and came up with a plan how to you know, kill the lion, right? But we don't. So, you know, we know that about human brains. So with that knowledge in hand, we then need some robust systems and structures that say, when my brain gets a bit noisy and spicy, and I want to just go back to preservation and just look after myself. How can I orientate to the team? How can I orientate to our tactics and what we need to do? So I say that the key to high-performing teams is how much they don't change. And I'll say that again. 
it's actually individuals as well, but even more so, I think groups are more vulnerable to change because of all of the human synergistics and that individualism. So we know how to play, we know our tactics, we know what works for us. It might have actually got us all the way through the season to a certain point. Now some pressure comes or some, you know, talented opposition, whatever. And then we change, we deviate from our game plan, we deviate from our leadership structures, we do, you know, whatever happens. And that's always the review. You know, what happened? Oh, we, we abandoned what we said we were going to do, right? So I'm really big on saying, let's not lift. If you want to perform well with pressure, don't be Superman or Superwoman. You don't need to lift. You need to replicate. Mm -hmm. Be boring. Be normal. Be predictable. Just do the same. Bracket. Don't bloody change. Like how good you are at not changing. Oh, it's a grand final. We've got to dig deep and find something special. That's the worst coaching advice on planet history, like in the history of the planet. Like what we've done all season to get us to the grand final has worked. And now on the day that it matters, I'm going to tell us to go out there and do something different. Like it's just so illogical when you think about it. Yet I see that every day in the, in the locker room, right? Searching for something special versus, okay, guys, let's look each other in the eye and make a commitment that whenever adversity comes, which it will, we can lose today, but let's not lose through having changed. We'll be disappointed if the other team are simply better than us. We will absolutely be disappointed. But the worst thing in life is regret. The drive home from the stadium where you've just lost in the grand final and you're all feeling that sense of regret because we know we deviated from what we said we we're going to do. It must take so much courage as well under pressure in a team environment when you're out there and you actually feel like an individual on the field who could make all the difference and have the super heroic try across the line. It must take so much courage to go, no, we've got the plan. Let's work the plan. Literally, yeah. Yeah, it takes, it takes commitment to truly buying into what you say you're going to stand for as a team. That's why culture matters. You know, values work matters, not just words on a wall that I see in a lot of footy clubs that don't really glue people together. You've got to do it to a point where when you talked earlier about, you know, what really drives people, it's got to be so important that that's more important than my own stuff that's going on for me right now, my own impression management how I'm going, how I'm looking, my own individual statistics, my own, you know, whatever that is. And it's like you need to create a culture where the individual is secondary to that of the, of the group. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, when we think about all these different tactics, tools, so, you know, um, mental imagery, uh, breath work, where does that stuff come in helpful? For someone might have listened today and be like, oh, positive psychology and all that stuff okay we'll throw it out the window but i know that you don't mean that at all mm. where is the right place for those tools and strategies yeah it's about the function of them it's as simple as that what is the function if i'm doing imagery because i'm trying to connect myself to a, a fine motor pattern of a particular skill that really helps my you know, motor memory consolidation and therefore it's building my competence of that skill, fantastic. It's a, and there's good neuroscience to show that if you do imagery around skill development and consolidation, it's actually very useful. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing what I'd call old school imagery of lie back and picture yourself in front of the crowd, you're filled with confidence, there's not a worry in the world, you're, it's actually going to set you on fire because not only does it not work when you then walk out there and it's different than what you've imagined because all of a sudden you are a bit nervous you are a bit worried you are a bit you know you didn't sleep well the night before whatever's going on for you the normal trimmings of you know pressure we have what's called metacognitive judgment we 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 start talking in our head about what it's not oh oh this isn't what i thought this isn't how i thought i'd feel oh no, and you start predicting that because it's different, you're not going to then perform well. And then all of a sudden we're tangled in our brain and you're somebody who's normally pretty competent and you're just completely distracted by your own internal state. So yeah, imagery, I, I tell all my colleagues in the, in the industry, if you're going to roll out any form of intervention, 
you better understand the neuroscience and psychology behind it because a lot of people do well-intentioned interventions that actually do harm. Mm -hmm. And that's the last thing any grit supporter, mental skills coach, psychologist wants to do. They all want the help, but yeah. actually they could be doing harm without doing the right yeah. research. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's because it's intuitively logical. I can lie here in my room and go through it in my mind and, oh, that's nice and feels good. And you feel like you're getting a bit of training done, even though you're not running around the field. And it's like, I'm not saying no to imagery. I'm saying make sure it's about skill development and you're not trying to recreate that emotional state. It's like when people do pressure training drills. Well, we're going to recreate the pressure of grand final. It's just not going to happen. Like, it's like dancing with your cousin at the wedding. It's different than dancing with a cute bridesmaid, right? I love it. <laughs> you, you still want to do the right steps though. So training matters and, you know, do the right steps, but don't expect it to feel the same as grand final day. It never will. It doesn't have to. Yeah. That's such a great way to put it. It's funny when I think back again to that 13 to kind of 17 year old stage where I was doing a lot of mental imagery and, you know, there's maybe seven and a half thousand strokes, you know, like uh, in drumming. So seven and a half thousand uh, different ver um, tempos, different heights, dynamics. I found it really useful to go through mental imagery with that. Like it was, I could spend two hours in my mind going through maybe a three minute performance. And I'd keep getting distracted and come back and distracted, come back and working on these tiny nuances and what my, my hand be doing, and how will it feel on the, you know, the micro feel of the thumb, what will the thumb be doing? How will it be placed? That was powerful as opposed to yeah, what you mentioned a minute ago, saying just how will it feel with the crowd there and how, how, how great will it be? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Now you um, spent a little bit of time on the golf circuit and I see that um, it says on your site, you've done a bit of caddying as well. So when you're in the role of caddy, you know, for the caddies that are listening right now and the support people, what does that involve? What are you focused on? What are you looking out for? What are you not saying? Or what are you asking? <laughs> That's a cool question. I, I haven't been asked that um, before. I like it. Um, yeah, well, firstly, I'm, I'm not talking heavily about club selection and wind direction and and yardages <laughs> because I'm a psychologist not a caddy and I, I admire the, the skill that caddies you know have out there and um, I normally only caddy when it's a requisite intervention like my preference is they always have a really skilled caddy on their bag now some don't have caddies so you've been flown to the other side of the world you might as well carry the bag because you're there and what have you but typically it's like this person just can't quite seem to do what we need them to in that moment in psychology the terms a transition object so you know for the parents listening you know what the first day you send your kid to school one of the best things you can do is give them mum's hairband or brooch or something that they can carry with them to keep a connection to mum or dad um and it's you know it's a transition object right uh, and there's plenty of psychological science to show the benefit of us having those gestures and what have you. Well, psychologists can play that role, right? So you're talking to an athlete about what they need to do and how they, you know, are willing to stick to the, the right shot at the right time and not deviate, not desell the club head or steer the shot or club down or all those classic avoidant things we see on the golf course. Me just being there carrying this set of bags, you know, set of sticks is just, you know, a bit of accountability, right? It's, you know, okay, what's the shot here? Well, the, the shots are three, three wood, you know, to carry the, the trap and blah, 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 blah. Cool. And what's your brain telling you? Ah, uh, it's saying three iron layout. I'll say, right. Thanks, brain. Interesting. Now, what did we say we're going to do here today, right? You said you want to be top 10 in the world. We know we've got the competence to hit that shot. So we're not, you know, overstretching. It's just fear telling you to, to go to a safer option. So what do we want to lean into right now? Do you want to you know, buy in and give that fear power or do you want to make a towards move to being the, you know, a, a move that's moving towards being that top 10 golfer? So a willingness to commit to the shot effectively. So that's a lot of my role out there is letting them do the, the reverse engineering of what the golf course is telling them they need to do, but then just helping them in that moment be better at staying with a bit of perspective and just noticing the thoughts and what's showing up for them around, you know, sort of emotion governed golf versus really pragmatic golf of what is the shot and well, the shots that my brain's trying to tell me it's something different. Cool. Let's be willing to actually hit the shot that matters. 
That's brilliant. And again, it brings it back to what you said right at the start. Focus on what matters. Correct. That's that's brilliant. And again, it, it really simplifies it. It's not this, um, we're going to stay focused on all what could go wrong and what's going on in your brain. It's actually, where are we headed? What are you committed to doing? Becoming top 10. Okay. What's your brain telling you? Okay. Let's do that. And uh, it's great. It's, it's just next level accountability. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. And normally I find that you only need to do that one or two times and then they update their mental model of, oh, for so many years, I let my fear and worry dictate my course management. You know, for so many years, I would, you know, just desell that club face or, you know, hit a really safe steery shot or, you know, my target that I'd pick would be, you know, always a bit middle of the green, not a little bit towards the flag or, or the opposite, you know, I go into cowboy mode and just start hunting the pin because I'm, you know, versus actually taking the right shot, which is the middle of the green in this, in this instance. So, so much of my work is around their course management and willingness to hit the right shot. And then, you know, my job is to do the psychological training in the background to free them up so they don't then change their biomechanical output. Yeah. And again, it comes back to what I think you said earlier as well, consistency and just being consistent with what they do physically and setting up the infrastructure up here neurologically so that they can do that. Yeah. 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 The old, what would you do on a program? What would you do on a Tuesday right here? Well, if it's a Tuesday or a pro, you know, I'd I'd hit the three wood off the deck and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Do that. Is that a high risk shot or is that a still a that's still a seven, eight out of ten shot? Yeah, no, it's a standard shot I've hit any day of the week. Oh, okay. Well, the fact that we're in the lead pack and your brain's telling you don't stuff it up from here. If you stuff it up from here, you'll never, you know, you won't win and you'll be embarrassed and humiliated. And, oh, lots of you know loud narrative going on. Let's just notice that, make some room for it. Now let's talk about your willingness to connect to the best version of yourself, uh, those values in action in the pursuit of being top 10 in the world. And Let's just stop, drop anchor, and then focus on the shot at hand. That's great. And what you described beautifully there, Jonah, was building capacity. What you just said in the last 30 seconds was just the best description of how you actually build capacity for self. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. It's a, it's a really fun part of my job is helping people just realize they already have the ability. They already have the capacity. They they already do it typically in other domains like i often say when's the last time you went for a a pretty decent run where you felt lactic acid like oh do that probably two or three times a week or whatever okay did you call an ambulance when the lactic acid showed up no why not well i knew i wasn't going to die from it okay any other reasons well, I've felt it before. Okay, so it's familiar. Yeah, so it, it seems to always show up when you're working hard. Well, yeah. So it's almost feedback that you actually are running fast because you don't feel lactic acid if you're running slow, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it tells me I'm actually working hard. Um, does it pass? Yeah, yeah, it always passes. Okay, right. And you just sort of accept that and know that that's just the price of entry of doing a, a hard workout. Yeah, of course I do. Hmm. I wonder if I change the word lactic acid to anxiety. Mm-hmm. Felt it before? Yeah. Does it show up when you're doing things of importance and maybe it's feedback that you're actually doing something well? You know, you've earned the right to feel it? True. Do you die from it? No. Does it pass? Yes. Okay. So how about we just let it be there and focus on what you need to do right now? That's so good. And that's like, I, I my visual was like, I can see the pressure and the anxiety and I've just gave it a hug like hey welcome back let's yeah. do this that That's was good. just you're embracing yeah. it right but think back to when you were 12 and you first did that running race and lactic acid showed up you know it did hijack my attention I was stopping running and looking down at my legs and slowing down and you know it, it affected my motor pattern and you know until you get coached where it's like, listen, your legs will get heavy. You'll feel it. Let's not change your, your, your patterning. Well, it's the same with anxiety, right? The first time we start to feel it, we normally respond and it wins and pulls us around. And then as we mature, we learn, okay, I need to keep running towards life with that there. And see these insights and this approach to really embracing pressure and, and playing with it 
Can this be something we start at a young age or do we have to wait till we're adults, wait till we're really feeling the weight of the world? Can we start this young? Well, we have to start it young. Hmm. I mean, we're probably going to get a little bit, I don't know, a bit philosophical here, but like the, the rate of mental health in the Western world is just going through the roof. And I would argue that a huge percentage of that is because of how we're exposing our children to discomfort. When, when a kid feels sad, we feel this immense need to instantly take it away. When they stand up in English class and talk, they get anxious and we need to send them to the sick bay to pat a dog or something. Like there's all these crazy things out there. How are you feeling? How are you feeling? Tracking symptoms in schools and footy clubs. How are you feeling? Not, are you focused and ready to play today? Break that out of 10. It's, we're, we're obsessed with symptoms and internal experiences. So back to your question around kids, we have to let them know that the world is hard. Life is hard. That if you want to feel joy, you're going to feel sadness. If you want to feel elation, you're going to feel fear and disappointment. Like they, they're one and the same. Like, I love saying this, just every, every listener here right now, just in your mind, I want you to list every positive emotion you can think of. Most would have thought of happiness, love, excitement. Then they would have got into the thesaurus and got a bit confused with, does, does joy, is joy the same as happiness? And, well, probably not. It's all pretty similar, right? Like elation, play on the spectrum. So really there's only love, happiness and, you know, excitement or something. There's probably a few others, right? If I said now list every traditional negative emotion you can think of that humans experience. Anxiety, doubt, grief, spite, envy, regret, um, depressed, depression or depressed, um, hatred, um, Help me out here. What else can I do? Anger comes up. Yeah. Anger. Um, Way more. That's easier to list those negatives, right? Regret. I think I might have said that one. You know, all of a sudden I've got 10 of these negatives. Mm. Yet apparently, according to Western civilization, certainly marketing, <laughs> if you're not happy and in love, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> you need certainly some medication all that new car, all that new outfit, all that new whatever. So you better buy this product to get yourself back to that land of, you know, hedonism and what have you. So, you know, without getting too caught up in, in that, it's just really important for us to understand that if you want to live a life of meaning and high, sustained high performance and thriving, it's not this little bubble of happiness, joy and love. All my clients who seem to navigate life well and do really cool, interesting things, if you actually reverse engineer their last three months, it's full of tales of doubt and worry and setback and humiliation and, and confusion and, you know, tough stuff because they're trying to do cool things. We've got to allow our children to scrape their knees when they're learning to ride a bike, you know? We're actually depriving them of learning those neural substrates and learning that those relationships to those feelings so that later in life, when they leave this beautiful bubble of school where they're completely mollycoddled or whatever, and they go to their first job and their boss doesn't bully them, isn't sexist, racist, misogynistic or hypercritical, merely says, oh, yeah, we don't put coffee in the photocopying machine. And they turn around and, and, and claim that they've been bullied at work. <laughs> you know, like it's, we're setting them up for failure. So, so true. I've seen this in workplaces and I've chatted with people that have had, you know, personal grievance against them for saying very similar things to what you've just said and uh, being told, you know what, I, I can't be um, given any feedback right now because it's Friday afternoon. My friends are going out tonight and I'm not going out. So I'm anxious and upset about that. So right now you can't give me feedback. And it's just a perfect example of what you just described. Yeah, it's, it's a shame, right? To think that somebody has been exposed to a world that has restricted their ability to navigate 
some tough internal experiences. Mm. Yeah. hundred percent. And honestly, there will be some parents listening right now that, that are high performers that are, you know, they've got lots of things on their plate and they have this guilt of, Oh my goodness, I'm spending time growing my career and doing things I love. And I'm not getting that time with my kids and they're suffering because of this, but actually there's some goodness in that because your kids are getting to see that you're having to work and sweat and toil and go through stress to achieve what you're trying to achieve. So you're actually modeling some great stuff. 100%, particularly if you verbalize it. Mm. The greatest gift you can share with your children is that you feel the emotions that they're feeling in the grade four playground. Because they think that you're Superman or Superwoman because as adults, we're pretty good at maybe state, you know, stability of behavior. We still go to work. We still come, you know, but we might, you know, internalize but not share it. Whereas they are wanting to not go to school because of that bully or they're not wanting to go to school because they've got to stand up in English class and do that recital or, you know, they're, they're feeling these intensities of emotion and they're naturally wanting to, you know, be governed by that. The greatest gift you can say to your child as you're driving them on the weekend to their sporting matches you know, how you doing, champ? And if he or she says, oh, I'm actually pretty nervous, you know, not saying, oh, don't, don't be nervous. You've got nothing to be nervous about. Believe in yourself. You're right, champ. You're good. You're good. You know, like instantly trying to invalidate their experience and telling them that there is something wrong with them for feeling that way. Yeah. Flip it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I used to get nervous before my matches too. Man, you should have seen me this week going into the boardroom. I was so worried. I stayed quite late the night before looking at my presentation notes, you know, and even afterwards, I was sort of a bit critical of myself, like mm, probably could have done a better job. But, you know, look, I walked in there and I did the best I could. And that's the main thing, you know. But, yeah, I can totally get that you feel a bit nervous before the match because it just tells me you really care about your team and playing well, hey? All of a sudden, you've given your child permission to worry, permission to be human, permission to feel, permission to have fears of failure. You're not going to, you know, you might have to be a bit firm in, hey, we're still going to go out and play and not let your teammates down, you know, and that's that, you know, nudge into that behavioural exposure. But the invalidation of their experience means they literally think something's wrong with them for feeling what they do because they just don't see you. So, yeah, I know I'm drumming into it. I'm super passionate about that. The gift you can give from to your kids is normalizing their experience and showing them that you feel the exact same repertoire of emotions 40 years later you're still feeling it in your work setting or your personal life setting or whatever yeah that's really powerful jonah thank you for sharing that as a dad that really you know it really helps me in terms of i've got a six and a half year old and uh that really helps me in terms of conversations because he's experiencing all these things with sport and school and people and it's yeah. really interesting we want to take their pain away of course. The role of a parent is, you know, they drop their Lego helicopter that they spent 25 minutes building and all it's instantly, oh, mate, we'll, quick, we'll, we'll fix it, we'll build it again. We'll... Instantly, we want to rescue and take away their pain. Versus what's just the, stopping... Sorry to interject, but what's the long-term, like if we keep jumping in, we keep fixing, what's the long-term damage there that's potential? Well, we know they're experientially avoidant, right? So anytime they're faced with some form of challenge, They'll, they will seek a, a, an avoidance of it. So they won't pursue a career that's scary. They won't speak up in the team meeting. They won't actually go ask that girl out at the bar that they really want to ask out. So all of a sudden, they live a life of mediocrity because they take the safe option everywhere they turn. Or when true adversity comes, they then go into more destructive patterns of numbing that discomfort through substance, through internet addiction, through whatever. So we see that we see it feeds into future psychopathology or life choices that are far from where they may you know they could have lived up to mm, that's brilliant and I'm, one thing i was thinking about was you know, incredibly incredibly well studied on psychology performance psychology can you remember times in your life whether it was a high school or post high school where you were in some performance setting where you thought oh my god if i if i knew what i knew now back then that would have changed that whole experience that's why I got into the profession. Now, there we go. Tell me, tell me, tell me. Yeah, yeah. I was about 13 or something playing tennis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was never amazing, but I was good enough to play in a sort of a competitive environment. And, you know, that second serve break point just used to be my Achilles heel. 
you know, I would desell the racket head, I'd just tap it in because I was so caught up in not double faulting. And typically you hit a soft second serve and the opposition just steps in and you know crunches it and you'd lose the point anyway, right? <laughs> and it used to infuriate me because I'd be like, what am I doing? Ironically, at the same time, at the time I was 13, I was lucky enough to live in a small sort of town where, you know, if you wanted to play sport, if you're any good, you're playing men's grade by the time you're 13. Great. So I was playing cricket, water polo with, you know, grown men, which was a fast track to probably learning some 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 grit. But <laughs> I was getting MVP. I was getting best in the water for water polo on grand final day against grown men or whatever. The harder the challenge, the bigger the game, the it just used to bring something out in me where I just just loved it. I just I just dial right in. I just I think I was just so self-sacrificial to the team that I had to forgo any nerves or anxiety and you know learn to just be that's is what it is but me playing my role is more important so I used to perform really well but then I'd have to go home at night and try to reconcile that how can I go and play a grade water polo and play well and go and absolutely stuff up in tennis when it's just me and of course the group versus the individual and all that stuff's very obvious now but at that tennis tournament a psychologist came in and presented and he did a talk and my life just changed. I just was like, that's exactly what's happening for me. And I was like, well, I guess that's what I'm gonna do when I grow up. I'm gonna be a sports psychologist. So from the age of 13, I knew what I was gonna be. And that's what I pursued. Jonah, that's beautiful. And it's, it's incredible to hear that. Uh, I need to uh, introduce you to a friend in the States, Dr. Haley Perlis. She shared almost an identical story. She was a, a skier, a, a really good skier and was on track for the Olympic team. And about 13 or 14, a psychologist came and had a chat and it changed her life. And that's what she wanted to be. And I think you two uh, would have a lot in common. You get on very well. And I love that you followed your nose. You you were inspired by that and you took action. You just didn't think about it. You you took that action that you talked about earlier in the show. Mm. No, I, I say I'm one of those annoying people who had clarity of what they wanted to be when they grew up and then actually went out there and did it. And so I, you know, I do work with people who have that existential angst of career changes and nuancing, but I've got to be very careful that for me, I had a very, quite a, a narrow sort of calling. Mm. Yeah. And it's interesting you call it a calling because I know when I've seen you on stage in person and when I talk to you and I'm sure the listener can hear it, there's a passion about what you do. You're not calling it in, you know, I turn up and I say the thing, I ask the question. Like you're passionate about helping people fulfill their potential at the highest level. Yeah, I think I love the complexity of it. It brings, well, it brings my values to life, right? It, mm. it's, 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 it feels like sometimes if you study something or you learn something and you're like, this is too good not to share with the world. And I'm, that's not coming from a place of ego. It's, I see so much psychology out there that I feel really uncomfortable around. I'm like, oh, that's actually not following the science or that's a bit lazy or complacent or outdated. And when you sit there and you know the formula, it's not me. Like I always say, this is, yeah, I've got a certain personality and maybe an ability to, like you said, take psychological theory and make it relatable. But I didn't invent the psychological science. You know, I'm just the, I'm just the medium of, what somebody else has already studied and shown works. I just want to make sure we can bring that at scale because I think a lot of human suffering exists when it doesn't need to. Yeah, that's amazing. And for the person who can't afford to get an incredible performance psychologist like you, is there a book or a couple of books or a place you would say, hey, this is where some of the models are and you can go and learn about them? Yeah, sure. Um, haven't finished mine yet. I'm, I'm a couple of chapters in. Um, Love it. Is, is, you know, Dr. Russ Harris, he's, an, he's a Brit who is an Aussie who was a medical doctor and he was consulting every day as a GP and saying something's just not right here. I'm just writing prescriptions for antidepressants and anti-anxiety and just, he's like, this isn't medicine. You know, somewhere along the way, we, did, we got lost in what medicine is. Medicine is helping people be healthy, not just the removal of suffering and certainly not just pharmacological interventions. And he discovered the same framework that I use called acceptance and commitment therapy is one of the main frameworks I use. It's not the only one. Um, and he literally put his prescription pad 
you know, pad down. Mm -hmm. And now he's become an internationally acclaimed train, the trainer of health professionals and alike around the world. And he wrote a really cool book called The Happiness Trap. Cool. Okay. Now it is a bit focused on anxiety and ill health, but you, you read it and you'll be able to transfer it into your world. Um, it's got the main tenets of what I do. I've just taken that same science and applied it to the high performance context. It's incredible. Thank you for sharing that. And when your book is published or close to being published, let's get on again and let's talk about it and get it out to the listeners because I know they'll be keen to get their hands on it. Yeah, I'd love to. No, that's awesome. Well, look, one last question. And I just want to thank you again for taking the time and making the space to connect so deeply. But I'd love to just um, ask you to fast forward in your mind. It's the last day here on earth. You know it's your last day, you've been told. And it's actually your last five minutes. And someone very young in your family, someone near and dear, maybe a great grandchild or a grandchild, comes up to you and says, Jonah, I really want to lead my life on purpose. What advice would you give them? Great question. Discover who you are in terms of what really matters. So life is about doing the things that matter with the people that matter in a values-based way. Mm -hmm. So take the time to truly find out the things that matter to you and don't do other things out of parental guilt or societal pressure. Find the things out that matter to you. Surround yourself with the people that genuinely matter and then get after it in a values-based way. Amazing. Such incredible, incredible advice and wisdom. And I know that there'll be a listener right now that that's going to help for them in their day and their month and their life right now. So, Jonah, I want to say a heartfelt thank you. And for the listener, I'm going to say in the show notes, go down there and you'll see there's links to connect with Jonah directly at jonaholiver.com. Uh, please go and connect with them. Keep an eye out for the book, which will be in the mix. And I'll be sure to let you guys know. I'll be, I'll be sure to get Jonah back on to promote it and talk about it. So, Jonah, thank you so much. Love the chat. Appreciate the time. Hey guys, if you enjoyed the content today, please smash that subscribe button below. And if you want to become part of my community, I've got an amazing free Facebook group. Please come and join us. The link is in the description below. And also, if you've got any questions about today's session, I'd love to know. Just comment below and I'll be sure to get back to you guys. Have the most amazing day.